All right. In theory, once again, we're live. Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, another uh, special interview on Open Space here on my YouTube channel. Um, this week, we are going to be talking about a topic that, uh, that we've talked about quite a bit on the channel, just all about in space, uh, in situ resource utilization, uh, manufacturing, harvesting resources in space. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the moon, and I am joined by Alex Ignatiev. Alex, welcome to uh, Open Space. Thank you, Fraser. So for people who don't know who you are, uh, who are you? What do you do? Okay, so I'm the Chief Technology Officer of uh, Lunar Resources, Inc., a company we started a couple, three years ago. Uh, I was the director of the uh, Center for Advanced Materials at the University of Houston for 20 years or so, working with NASA. Uh, in fact, uh, was the PI and program director for a large NASA program oh, 15, 20 years ago called the Wakefield Facility Program where we did the first and only fabrication of thin film materials in the vacuum of space. Wow. Uh, everybody thinks about a vacuum as a detrimental environment. Uh, we love vacuum. <laughs> I do things in vacuum chambers. We make uh, unique functional thin film materials and devices. So we did that on orbit on three shuttle flights. And now we've taken that heritage and moved it forward to incorporate uh, a variety of different materials that we can, uh, we'll call functional materials that we can uh, de de uh, deposit in the space environment, both on the moon and in low earth orbit and in anywhere else uh, uh, in space, as long as there's a good vacuum environment there. And we also are now taking and, and have a program to process the lunar dust, the lunar regolith and extract in that processing oxygen, which I don't care about. <laughs> because it's an oxidizer. I right. want to have clean metals, not oxidized metals. Humans but might appreciate it for like some oxygen. reason. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but the important part, a more important part for us is the extraction of things like iron, aluminum, silicon, calcium, magnesium, uh, yeah. all of those uh, materials that are readily available in the lunar regolith. And we extract that and then use that as raw materials for our uh, thin film deposition and processing product. All right, so let's so let's break this up into two parts. First, let's just talk about like the raw ingredients. So, if I was going to the uh, I don't know to the grocery store to pick up the raw ingredients from the moon, um, the lunar, <laughs> what is there to work with? You talked about a bunch of the chemicals, but sort of you know let's go right. through like like and okay. and in sort so of first quantities. Of all uh, I'll just comment on the process that we're, that we're, that we're utilizing, and, and I'll just briefly note, it's called magma electrolysis or metal oxide electrolysis or molten regolith electrolysis. Um, and this is uh, a, a process by which we don't need any other reagents other than the lunar dust and electricity. Mm -hmm. And with that process, you can extract out, you can dissociate the oxygen bond with the metals, and you can extract out iron, aluminum, silicon, calcium, magnesium. And I'll give you as an example, um, aluminum we can use for our uh, essentially making a thin or thick film transmission lines on the surface of the earth. Wow. Uh, sorry, surface of the moon. Surface of the moon, yeah. So we yeah. simply deposit them in the vacuum environment as a strip line uh, and, and that is now metallic and conducting, and therefore that there's your transmission line if you want to go from point A to point B, as an example. Right, right, there right. Are other yeah. applications for that, but there's an example for aluminum. Iron, it turns out iron, uh, we have make a fair amount of iron with our, our test um, facility. Uh, and then iron, you can, you can make rebar out of it for lunar concrete. You can make pipes out of it for conduit, for uh, fluid transmission. You can make I-beams for structural support. Uh, you know, we end up with molten iron coming out of the bottom end of our reactor, and we can then apply that iron in many, many different mm -hmm, ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a couple of examples of how we would utilize the raw materials uh, on the moon. Specifically, silicon is of interest to us because with silicon, you can do all kinds of interesting things, solar cells, transistors, diodes, um, and these are made in vacuum chambers here on the Earth. Right. And so, so therefore... We can make them on the moon. I don't need a chamber there. So this is an example of the kind of materials that we would extract out from the lunar dust and apply it for functional 
after unique functions. Right. And so on the, I guess on the wind column, you've got that vacuum to be able to work with. You take your, your spacecraft land, you don't need to build a really, um, you know, you need to build the vacuum chamber to be able to do it. There is, I'm, you know, for half of the, for I guess 14 days in a row, you've got ample amounts of electricity and then, and then you have very little of it for a while. Um, so what are the challenges of attempting to both harvest and do any kind of manufacturing in that environment? So, so, so the first thing that I've always referred to is uh, there are three important things you need on the moon or in space. Number one, electrical energy. Number two, electrical energy. <laughs> Number three, electrical energy. <laughs> right. And so that's the driver for everything. Uh, you know, you can survive, one could survive on the moon for a, for a few a few uh, Earth days or maybe a lunar day <clears throat> without electricity, but I doubt it. Um, and so our first step uh, in terms of uh, re utilization of resources on the moon is in fact to make thin film silicon solar cells on the moon to generate the energy that we need to do all the rest of the processing. And we have a process by which uh, we can make these thin film silicon cells directly on the lunar surface. So we can pave the moon with solar cells right. uh, by our process and then utilize the electricity to do all the rest of the things we want to do, to build, to move, to de design, etc. Right. And that's and those are like uh, I remember sort of researching this. It's a different kind of cell. They're made with crystals, right, that are they can be sprayed and they don't like atmosphere. But right. on the moon, it's not so, a problem. So, so in terms of solar cells, there are nominally three or four different kinds. Number one, the ultra high efficiency, what are called 3,5 gallium arsenide based right. solar cells. These are now champion cells are in the laboratory at 47%. Wow. Uh, in production, they're probably more like a 30% or so. Right. Um, however, uh, that's a very exotic material. We did in fact grow gallium arsenide materials for, silicon, for solar cells on a Wakefield program. Uh, you need a crystalline substrate to do that, and there are no crystalline substrates on the moon. Um, so that would be a challenge to do it there. Uh, there are silicon solar cells, and then there are a, a copper, uh, sorry, um, Indian phosphide, Indian, uh, Indian, uh, Indian sulfide, Indian phosphide. Uh, those, the, 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 the Indian phosphide, Indian sulfide cell called thin film cells, they can be grown on glass. Uh, their efficiencies are like 18%, between 15 and 18%. Um, there's not much indium, phosphorus, or, or, or sulfur uh, hmm. on the moon. Uh, what's on the moon is silicon. Right. And we, of course, make silicon solar panels. Uh, there are, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of megawatts of, of silicon solar panels out there right now. Um, and these are made with crystalline silicon. And they are running 18 20% efficiency. Right. But the silicon you start with has to have large single crystal grains to get that kind of efficiency. Perovskite um, is, the, is the technology that I was thinking of. Maybe a unique way to do that. Sorry. I was thinking of perovskite as a... Perov perovskites are, are, are a new area, um, and they are uh, interesting in terms of solar cell stress, really. The problem is for perovskites, you need uh, all of those uh, lead, uh, um, uh, uh, let's see, lead, zirconium, titanium. Right. Those are not really prevalent. Titanium is, but the rest are not really prevalent on the moon. So to extract them there and utilize them, there would be a challenge. Right. I go back again to silicon. Uh, the crystalline silicon cells, there are specific ways to make them crystalline. We, that, that requires a fair amount of infrastructure, which we don't want to bring to the moon at this point in time. However, there, there are uh, silicon solar cells called microcrystalline, where the grains of the silicon are small. The smaller the grain, the lower the efficiency. But efficiencies in the, say, uh, 6 to 10% uh, value are available, are doable. We've done something close to that. And our approach is, uh, and, and those microcrystalline silicon solar cells can be grown on things like glass. Right, right. And so our approach is, uh, we've made glass out of lunar regolith. You melt it and you solidify it and it becomes a very nice glass, wow. highly insulating, very smooth. Um, and so we can now melt the glass on the, on the moon uh, in a strip, as, as an example. 
deposit on that glass aluminum, which we extracted from the regolith, deposit on that glass is silicon thin films to make the solar cell. And so the ball aluminum is the bottom electrode and then deposit on top of that uh, an aluminum electrode that has patterns, fingers to collect the charge. That's the top electrode. We have a solar cell is done. Yeah. And, and these and are all thin film materials. And so, I mean, at this point, I'm, I'm sort of imagining a, a some kind of robot crawling across the surface of the moon, ingesting lunar regolith and then leaving behind it a long trail of well, solar it, cell that yeah, is also that, a wire. That's a little bit... That that's a little bit beyond the imagination that we have. Sure. Uh, but yeah. the way we structured this is essentially a rover. Yeah. A rover that rolls along the surface very slowly. It has a component that melts the regolith underneath of it, a second component to deposit the aluminum bottom electrode, and then another component to deposit the silicon uh, uh, junction, and then another de comp component to deposit the top electrode. And then a third comment, component to make the wires to interconnect all those. And I say wires, I mean thin film, right. aluminum strips. And I, so the rover then moves along the surface continuously. It goes around big rocks, but it's got a little bit of a plow in the front to smooth things out. It does the melting of the regular to deposit the, uh, the uh, solar cells. We've calculated that for our preliminary design of uh, the rover, working at 35% capacity on the moon, which means 50% is day and night, right? Right. So we've de we've degraded that. Um, we could we could generate 450 kilowatt capacity of electricity on the moon in one year. So and so this one rover crawling around on the moon would be ingesting regolith, depositing a sort of combination solar cell um, wire, sort of. It's, it's, and antenna <laughs> provides all this functionality simultaneously. And you figure you could do 400 kilowatts per year. Capacity, right. Right. We can make, we can make that many solar cells with our, and our, and our design is essentially a rover that's like a meter and a half by a meter by a meter. And what could you, know, you do with 400? Not large. No, that's large not big enough. at all. What could yeah. you do with 400 kilowatts? Like just to give people a sense of perspective, how much capacity is that compared That's to- That's about um, five times the capacity of the space station. And so a meter by meter rover working on its own for a year on the moon could make a uh, enough power really for a lunar base. Right, no exactly problem. correct. And, and you know, rovers, uh, you know, we've seen on Mars, rovers can work for two, three, four, five years. So figure in, in five years, you've got, what, two megawatts worth? And that's enough for a, a, you know, a, small, a small town for all yeah, intents and purposes. Right. I'll call it that way. Um, keep in mind that you know, the rover uh, working for one year at 35% requires refilling of raw materials. So we'd have to have the processor along with the rover on the moon. So it will process the regolith to extract out the aluminum and the silicon that we need. And then we'll have a little taxi running back and forth to fill up the rover right. um, and continue and then continue operation. Now, are That's the, kind of the, 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 the con op, so to speak. Right, now are the, like the elements that you require available in the right, uh, like quantities, the right ratios? Like if you just take pure regolith, are you gonna get too much okay. of one thing and not enough of another thing? Right. So, so um, the process, as I mentioned, for extracting the raw materials is um, is molten oxide electrolysis or molten regolith electrolysis. This is pioneered by uh, Don Sadaway at MIT. Don is also a principal in lunar resources, and we're 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 expanding and advancing in that technology that he originally developed. Um, it, it's a, essentially an electrolytic reactor. It requires a lot of power of the order of 3000 amps at maybe a couple of three or four watts. So you're talking about 15, 20 kilowatts of power. That's a lot, mm -hmm. okay? However, uh, our rover, if we take and load it with raw materials on launch, and, and the rover is about 250 or 300 kilograms, it's a moderate, very moderate size. Um, if you load it on launch in one day, it'll generate 40 kilowatts of solar cells. So that's more than enough to operate the processor to reload the, the rover for the next day. 
Right. As an example. So you sort of okay. feed it with the good stuff, and then, and then once it's and there, then, then it's process, on its own. Right. Correct. And then you've got we've got you know fourteen days to 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 load up the processor and run the processes and make sure we're the right. A silicon has to be relatively pure, so you have to run it twice through the process for all intents and purposes. Um, but that's the way that we would operate. Uh, the uh, the regolithic processor, all right, this molten regolith electrolysis system, uh, our, our prototype is about a cubic meter, so three by three by three feet. Um, it will run about 2,000 amps, um, and it will process uh, in a year about 65 kilograms of regolith. From that, we get around four kilograms of oxygen, to, uh, kilograms, sorry. Um, uh, Four, four tons, right. okay. 64 tons of regolith uh, processed in a year will give us four tons of oxygen, 12 tons of iron, almost four tons of silicon. Uh, and we just go down the line that way. Yeah. And those kind of numbers are significant enough to be able to do the kind of manufacturing fabrication um, tasks that we have in mind. Okay. So, I mean, this, this all sounds, you know, proof of concept um assuming i mean are there any big showstoppers right now from the tests that you've done on on simulant regolith like does it like is it all seem pretty feasible at this point to actually like once you get on the moon to get to get going yeah in fact our approach is in fact to do a proof of concept on the moon yeah uh nasa has a number of programs the prism program is a recent one we will be we'll be proposing to that um, you know, all of the components that we're talking about has, has been done. We've mm -hmm. done vacuum deposition in the vacuum of space. We've done the solar cells in a laboratory. We've done the extraction of oxygen and metals in the laboratory. Uh, we know how these things operate terrestrially. We've got to, uh, you know, launch them and land them on the moon. Now, the moon is a different environment. It's vacuum, which is great for our deposition process, but it's a little bit different for the except for the extractor, for, for the regular processor. It's also 1.6G. It doesn't bother the deposition process at all, but it will affect flow of, of, uh, of liquid, of liquid, of molten regolith inside the reactor itself. So those kind of couple of things we need to look at in more detail. Mm -hmm. We're modeling them right now, and there are good um, console models to allow us to do that. So we'll know what to expect. But by and large, the answer is, yeah, we need to we need to do a, a demonstration uh, on the moon uh, to show that everything that we have discussed is viable and doable at a large at a larger scale, and then in fact go the larger way. And as I go back to my comment about what do we need energy, 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 <laughs> our our approach is let's put the energy infrastructure in there first, right, and then think about what we can do with it. So then let's talk about how you imagine a mission going from sort of launch to to operation um how would you sort of see it like what kind of launch vehicle and then sort of timelines so so our, our approach would be uh we could probably launch uh, two processors and two uh and two rovers on a falcon 9. um so we you know duplicate what we in, in terms of our prototype right. scenario um, uh, the rovers would be deployed. Uh, they would start functioning uh, essentially immediately. Uh, the power for the melting and the deposition in rovers is concentrated solar. And concentrated solar, we can get to 85 or 90% efficiency, whereas any other conversions are in the teens or 20s. Now, when you so, say concentrated solar, you're talking about like some kind of parabolic mirror that's going to be concentrating solar right. energy into a smaller so a parabolic, area. Parabolic collector and light pipes that then end up uh, focusing the, 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 the solar energy in, in the small portions of the, of the bot under the rover. And, that's, and those small portions didn't get hot enough to be able to melt, et right. cetera. Right, right. Um, and so the rovers would, a rover or rovers would then be deployed, start making the cells. And when they make the cells, they'll make up the order of say 10 or 15 cells in series and then put a blocking diode. So that if, that, if something goes wrong in that section, that section goes offline. So you've already thought about that. Micrometeorite hit, dust, somebody drives over it with their, with their car or not. Yeah. Um, uh, 
uh, we could take it offline and continue operations. And in fact, the important part is, you know, we're kind of a self-replicating system. Something goes bad, we just go make another one right next door to right over it. Right. Pretty I mean, quite, we're, this is, you were on your way to making von Neumann probes at this point. I mean, we're just a couple of, a uh, couple of iterations away from, from, you know, exploring every part of the, uh, the, the Milky Way, but you know, let's, we'll keep our imaginations a little more under control today. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. So I'm, what then, you know, I'm kind of imagining you got this Falcon 9 rocket, you've got these four rovers on board, they land, they set up their, their power systems, they begin harvesting lunar regolith, building their system. You then, over the course of a year with two rovers, you've got 800, you know, close to a megawatt of capacity of solar energy. What next beyond proof of okay, concept? So the question is, yeah, what do we do with it, right? Yeah. Well, we sell it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're the, well, you're the, that, you know, you're the power company on the moon. Cheek. That, that actually is, you know, we're looking at doing this commercially. Mm -hmm. This is not a science project for us. Okay. Uh, however, we do have a science project that we would be involved in a very large one. That would be for all intents and purposes for us, a great commercial, uh, commercial step. Um, it turns out that uh, you may be aware of the fact that astrophysicists want to look at radio signals from deep space on the far side of the moon. Why? Because it's quiet. Mm -hmm. We are dirty. Earth is dirty with respect to radio signals. So they want to do it on the far side of the moon. And they need a large radio antenna to be able to pick up the very small signals. It's called a 21 centimeter line, mm -hmm. like from the beginning of the universe, from the origin of the universe. Um, there have been proposals to to build such uh, such antenna on the backside of the moon. Um, uh, sorry, to to uh, deploy such antenna, launch them in rockets and deploy them. Uh, that concept requires a large number of launches because of the mass and the size. There, people are interested in something a ten kilometer size antenna. Mm -hmm. um, we, on the other hand, have proposed that we can build that antenna for. Okay, we're not going to build electronics, but but the antenna is you know ninety four percent. The antenna array is ninety four percent individual antenna elements. Right, and these are uh, for for the for the twenty one centimeter line. These are essentially dipole antennas that are maybe ten meters long. So it's a ten meter piece of wire for all intents and purposes. So instead of bringing all that from the earth. We can make these on the moon, interconnect them, and make a 20 by 20 kilometer antenna array in something like three years of operation. And that's interesting. We actually did, I did a, a video about the lunar far side telescope concept. And, and I mean, before I sort of learned about your work, the original concept, as I understand it, was that you, there would be this spacecraft, the central hub receiver would go to the moon, land, on the far side, and then it would have multiple rovers that would that would spool out wire behind them and right. and place occasional antennas as they run along, and they would sort of create a a kind of Murchison array on the surface of the moon. You know, a big flower petal design that would that would build that you know that very large interferometer on the surface of the moon. But sort of listening to what you're talking about. You know, if you can just build the power system, the electrical cabling, and the um, the actual antenna itself, like, could you actually manufacture the antennas, the antenna system from the lunar regolith, or would you still need to bring that from the Earth and then? Plunk no, that in antenna? fact, our, our approach is that that will utilize the material from lunar regolith to do that, and and the far side. Uh, uh, the far side program it was one that was was kind of led by Jack Burns, mm -hmm. uh, and Jack is in fall in, involved with us in this this updated concept, so to speak, of of not bringing everything with with you, but yeah. making whatever you can. It turns out that that for twenty kilometers, we've done a calculation: hundred thousand antenna elements, ten meters long, <laughs> and so an antenna element is essentially you know uh, five centimeters wide strip of aluminum that may be uh, 10 microns thick right okay and we uh, so we'll do the same process that we talked about solar cells melt the regolith into a glass on top of that deposit 
our aluminum dipole antenna, the 10 meter long antenna, interconnected with the next one that we make and interconnected with the, with the following one, interconnect them all. And the electronics have to be brought from the earth. Right. Okay? Uh, the data collection, et cetera. But we can do this interconnection. 100,000 antennas would be, like I say, two and a half or three years of operation right. of a couple, two rovers. And, now, and, and that would be like, like, like building the square kilometer array plus plus on the moon. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, well, actually, it's 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 uh, it's f uh, almost f four and a half by four and a half kilometers in size. Okay. <laughs> right. So so the uh, and the, and the focus is that that the amount of aluminum, just the aluminum itself, to make the metal, uh, the, the 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 antenna, uh, it's it's about uh, thirty tons. Now, if you brought that from the earth as you rolled yeah. up wires which have, have, have to have a backing and an insulation to them, you're talking about two or three times that amount. Now you're talking about, you know, how many how many launches? Five, ten? We're talking about launching just two processors right. and two rovers. On one Falcon this. 9. And it's interesting, when you think about how difficult it would be to actually use that same technique here on Earth, it would be almost impossible because you've got weather and rain and right. and all kinds of environmental concerns that your rover is going to get caught in the mud and that it's not going to be able to extract the right kinds of resources yep. everywhere that it needs it. It would be impossible. And yet the moon, which is actually a much more uh, is is you would think is a far more expensive environment is actually sort of like this pure um, vacuum lab with equal amounts of the resources sprinkled around. And, uh, you know, I'm making one assumption there that you've got enough of the materials, you know, we talked about this earlier on, but just about the ratios. Is it roughly like is the is the regolith roughly the same or is it vastly different in different areas depending on what parts of the moon have been it, churned by, up? By, yeah, by and large, it's 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 very very similar. Uh, it's you know small grains, 100 microns in size. It, it's been there for the eons of micrometeorite uh, um, uh, uh, exposure. Um, there is some difference between the Mari and the Highlands uh, regolith. There's a bit more. Uh, aluminum uh, in in one case uh, uh, and and a bit more calcium in one case. Nonetheless, that's not critical to the processing that we're undertaking. Okay, uh, we'll be able to incorporate any any of that uh, regolith into the processor and extract what we need in terms of metals. Um, uh, let me. I mean, also remind you that we're extracting oxygen. Mm -hmm. And I said we don't need oxygen, so we'll sell that. Okay? <laughs> right. You're not just going to dump uh, it overboard. In any case, okay. Um, uh, so, so the, um, um, where was I going with that point? I oh, mean, just I, about I the, the ratios of the metals and, and pulling that up from the regular. Yeah. So, so, so it's not critical for our, uh, for our regular molten regular process to be able to be very precise in terms of composition. Um, now, now the beauty, uh, other beauty of the way we had, uh, approach this in terms of the RF, uh, uh observatory, okay, this array, um, the beauty of that, and the other beauty of that, is that we're talking about dipole antenna, and that's simply a, a, a strip line of, of, of wire, of aluminum, uh, as an example. Uh, by the way, it could be calcium, it could be magnesium, there is that on one also, because there's no atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We don't care about them oxidizing because they won't. Right. We can't use them here because they oxidize, right. especially calcium. Uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, the, the 10 meter wavelength of the dipole means that we can have all kinds of undulations and variations in that antenna element that are a fraction of the wavelength, let's say three or four meters. I could have a bump that's three or four meters high and go over it, wouldn't affect the sensitivity. I could, I could have a, a curve in the antenna and right. not a straight line, as long as it's you know, within a fraction of the wavelength, not gonna change the sensitivity. So we can, the rover can move around objects, go to unique positions, and without uh, degrading the quality of the antenna because of the very long wavelengths that we're, that we're focusing on. Right, right, right. And so if you're going to more of an optical telescope, then you would have to get the tolerances down significantly. Right, right. All right. If, uh, optically, it's, it's different than, than this, this long wavelength microwave stuff. Okay, so I mean, I mean, it feels like this is, this is very much a way to kind of bootstrap Manu resource acquisition and manufacturing on the surface of of the moon. 
let's sort of go into the future a few decades when this mission has been successful. We're clearly demonstrating the capability to to create fairly. I mean, I, I sort of see like the like the rudimentary kinds of things like solar panels and and building materials and large amounts of water, et cetera. What do you see the future holding for, you know, lunar manufacturing? Well, I mean, I, I go back to the, the point I made that, that whatever you want to do on the moon, you're going to need energy. Yeah. Um, I mean, people are talking, I have discussed, and I'm being facetious, you know, I'm taking a caterpillar tractor on the moon and moving the regolith around to form berms to cover up, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, life support systems as for, for personnel um, uh, habitats. Uh, that's not going to happen in that mode. All right. There are other ways to do what can be done. Um, but, you know, uh, let me backtrack one step and give you an example that um, in addition to the, to the micro antenna, there is a, a significant amount of interest drive programs uh, to look at the water at the poles of the moon or the water ice to extract it, to, to utilize it, etc. cetera. Uh, a number of the programs are talking about sending a, a rover down into the crater and mm -hmm. digging it up. I don't know of any system that can operate at 40 degrees Kelvin, any mechanical system will operate at 40 degrees Kelvin. I'll be, I'll be candid with you. Right. Um, uh, and so there are, there gotta be other ways to do that. And then there's some folks talking about shining solar uh, energy down there, et cetera, evaporating. Um, our approach is, is a bit different. You know, we can use, you, you need number one energy there to do that. Well, there are peaks of, of, of light that aren't, aren't Ill illuminated hundred percent of the time. And you'd have to put a uh, a solar panel up on a on a on a mast and rotate it as a function of time, etc. Do that's all doable. Right. But it's relatively complex in my perspective. Our approach is we'll we'll find a you know a, a crater of the order of a kilometer in size. We'll plate the inside of the rim with our solar cells. Right. So it's only totally and in one portion of that rim will always be lit. Right half, two thirds, whatever, as the room, moon rotates on its axis, will always have some portion lit, will always have electricity day, night, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And there's an example of how we're gonna apply our technology to advance utilization of the moon. Um, and that, that can be there also for habitat to support life support, all of that uh, can, can be utilized once you have the energy present there. People talk about doing electrolysis of the water to extract hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel. You need electrical energy to do that. How are you going to get it? This is one way to do it without going to the nuclear scenario, which may or may not be applicable uh, right. in, in the future. But, you know, you talked about how you're going to need to bring the electronics up from the Earth in the beginning. Do you think, are there any showstoppers why in decades from now with maybe with either more advanced manufacturing facilities, you know, is there any shortage of the kinds of elements on the moon that we would need to be able to do more advanced manufacturing? Is it a technique right. problem? Right, so, so that's, a, that's a good point. And I kind of alluded to the fact that you know, making our silicon solar cells, we're also going to make diodes, silicon diodes. They're very similar to solar cell. Um, that that I see that to be expanded into transistors. Uh, you know, the current microelectronics uh, world works in vacuum chambers. That's how they make uh, all the chip processes. They're in vacuum chambers and they're robotically controlled and they have arms moving from one chamber to another, etc. We don't need the vacuum chamber. We got it already. And so I can see that one can become much more complex in terms of your semiconductor technology on the moon than simply a solar cell or a diode. Uh, you'd need, uh, uh, you know, the kind of patterning equipment and additional processing that is done terrestrially. But I, I see that all uh, viable and possible as a function of time. Now, uh, the only thing that, you know, a lot of the, some, the semiconductor work currently underway uh, is in the in the three five material category, the gallium arsenide family. There's not much gallium and not much arsenic on the moon. There is very small amounts. You'd have to process a lot of regolith to extract that out. So I don't see that happening early on. As a function of time, yes, that can happen and you can start 
going beyond silicon right. as a semiconductor in your microelectronics arena. But for sure, you know, space, and not only the moon, but space in general is a great clean room. And, you know, whatever you want to do in a clean room, be it microelectronics oriented, can be done there. Yeah. Quite directly. It, it, it's still, that's such a fascinating insight that I haven't really, I hadn't really thought about. And I really appreciate that, 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 that you could, I mean, apart from maybe the, the bright solar radiation, you could just be, be producing things out in the open, like you're having a barbecue, right. a chip barbecue, because you aren't concerned about air and water and bacteria and and oxidization yeah, all in of that way right. it's just like this right. it's this absolute pristine environment that you're able to to work in and as uh, once you can get set up there all of this starts to turn into advantage assuming you've got power um let's uh, so taking the i guess the ideas that you have for the moon what about carrying that over to some of the other rocky worlds like like the asteroids how how would you adapt some of your strategies to to using asteroids? right so so um you know our, this approach will work on the asteroids quite directly you know the only problem the only challenge you would have is we, at, 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 on a body that has an atmosphere okay mars this would work directly we have a way to modify the process mars is a I want to get to that in a second. So let's atmosphere. let's talk about let's set aside Mars for now because I do, I definitely want to talk about Mars, but I'd love to talk about asteroids first, and then we'll move to Mars. Okay. So the asteroids all are great because there's no atmosphere there, and there's a vacuum there. Now the 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 acceleration of gravity is low mm -hmm. on 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 the asteroids, um, and so we have to have some way to um, an improved way of say moving the cro the rover on the surface, uh, maybe with some hooks or whatever in the wheels, something that I truly haven't thought about, but, but because of low gravity, you've got to be able to, to stick to the, to stick to the ground, so to speak, in doing the process. But everything else that we would do on the moon would be directly applicable uh, in, in an asteroid environment. Yeah. I mean, did you look um, at some of the uh, pictures the, the, of the, like Ryugu and Bennu and just see what sort of a boulder strewn nightmare they both are? I mean, when you look at the, at the lunar surface, it's just a beautiful, easy driving compared to what you it, would be facing is. on an asteroid. It is, yeah. Now, now, the only other difference in terms of asteroid is is that they have different compositions. There are various types of asteroids out there, uh, different compositions. Oh, I, I believe, and just from the pictures that we've, we've, we've had, uh, their surfaces look like they're covered with a regolith dust to begin with. They're, they aren't, they don't have a lot of sharp features. And so, uh, you know, be able to utilize that, but it may be a different composition. And that may be good. Maybe it's maybe it's platinum based, and we're going to be extracting platinum on the asteroid from the asteroids. I don't know. Right, and so you could end up finding that some asteroids are more rich in like gallium, like you're saying, or you know, some of these other things that you require. And could so be. you come set up your your solar array, and then you just specifically are are concentrating out that that element that's required and then sending that to some other distribution place. All right, let's talk about Mars because all eyes are going to be on Mars, but I think for 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 your purposes it's actually a much tougher world. So so on Mars in terms of our our, our approach, clearly the uh, material extraction by regolith electrolysis works directly. Not a problem there at all. So okay. same in fact there's a higher gravity gravitational field there than there is on the surface of the moon. Uh, so uh, we could directly take the, the Mars Martian regolith and start extracting out whatever is there. Iron for sure, oxygen that you'll need anyway. Uh, all that is quite direct and very doable on Mars. The, the, the functional thin film deposition process is not as direct because there is, a, there is an atmosphere, okay? Uh, it is not a vacuum environment. Uh, we have thought about how to do some differential, what's called differential pumping to allow us to, to see a vacuum environment, but that requires uh, something akin to a, a flimsy vacuum chamber. Um, and that's not right now in, in our mix, uh, but processing the, the, the Martian regolith to extract out the materials that are there and then apply those materials for any functions on Mars is quite direct. Now, what about the, the sort of significantly decreasing power from sunlight as you get out to out to Mars. I mean, it's like what? It's about a quarter at that point. 
Right, right. So, so, uh, so there's there's less solar insulation on the surface of Mars. So you need more solar cell area to be able to generate the energy that you that you'd like to have. And in our scenario, you know, that would mean making a lot more solar cells, but we couldn't make them in the process that we have right now about laying them directly on the Martian surface. Okay, um, there there are ways to be able to again. Uh, using a, a kind of a flimsy vacuum chamber, uh, making uh, solar cells in that environment robotically and, and putting them out on the surface of Mars. Uh, but uh, uh, we'd have to have a lot more area coverage there, independent of what cell that you, what cell you have, whether they're the exotic cells that, that are being made in laboratories uh, or whether they're, they're, they're simple silicon ones you still need, you know, multiple times that area that you have on the moon to be able to get similar uh, uh, power outputs. Right. Energy outputs. Right. Uh, and then what about for the outer solar system? I know, like, once you get out to Jupiter, you're at, like, 1 25th of the solar power. Um, yeah. But there's some that, really that fascinating real worlds challenge. out there. It becomes a real challenge. Um, a part of that challenge, actually, we can, we can utilize, not necessarily for, for generation of electricity, but for transportation of electricity, um, one of the programs that I'm involved with is, is, is to make superconducting wire. And uh, that, super, that wire is superconducting at temperatures of liquid nitrogen temperatures, 77 Kelvin. There are a lot of deep space areas that are colder than that. And so if you have probably a nuclear or an RTG for electricity, if you want to transport that electricity, do it by superconducting wire and don't lose any ener any energy by, to, to resistive losses. Right. So once again, taking advantage of the environment, the core. Right. Yeah. Right. Now you've got to be out there to do that. Uh, uh, but but you know, there's an example of possibilities. Uh, people are you know are going to focus on electric propulsion, where a large solar arrays uh, in space connected up to the propulsion unit and and interconnected. We would interconnect that with superconducting wire because you've got a lot of current passing through that system and you've got to be able to not lose the energy by resistive loss. So there's an example of where that would be applied. So it's really got to sound that like Titan would be the worst place for it's no power, thick atmosphere, right? Not a very useful surface, no metal but, on the but, surface. But the atmosphere on Titan is it's, it's mostly nitrogen. And nitrogen is benign. It's it's almost inert. And so it's almost like a almost like a vacuum, okay? Because it doesn't doesn't react readily with most everything. So there are some unique possibilities. It would be a tough place to live. <laughs> yeah, a little bit cold, a little bit cold. And what about going the other way? What about close in, like Mercury? I'm you've got at that point that the power, power, power problem uh, gets much right. More and Mercury also has has no no atmosphere for all intents and purposes. It's a small amount at the poles. Um, but um, uh, it could be utilized there, be utilized there quite directly. Yeah, that's really. Venus is a total different animal. Yeah, I guess Venus is the worst. You know, I'm, I'm always advocating for just pushing it right into the sun and calling it a day. But, you know, uh, some people seem to like it. Um, uh, but I mean, to be candid, we, we love the moon two reasons. A, it's got a beautiful, a, a beautiful environment for us. B, it's so damn close. Yeah. You can get to it and get back. We can debug everything there that you want to debug or uh, apply everything there that you want to apply and learn from that and go beyond. I, I'm not a proponent of going straight to Mars because I think we're not going to be very successful in doing that. Uh, but doing a stepping stone uh, arrangement is one that I, I propose. I, I, you know, proposed significant. So then, like, let's sort of play out the the future timeline, assuming that that you're able to get contracts, approvals, etc. What kinds of timelines could people expect to see into the future to start to test out some of these ideas? Um, it depends on what the application is. Uh, I'll be candid in terms of the the uh, radio observatory on the far side. I mean. We could start that. I mean, we have there's a customer there, mm -hmm. or there will be a customer there. We can start that immediately and and ha and see the need for the electricity that we generate for the array and for the array itself. So there's kind of a a great um, uh, science, technology, and commercial pro uh, program. Right. Right. So we hit the ground running and we work for two or three or four years and 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 finish it off. Um, 
if we go and just make solar cells on the moon tomorrow, that's great, but there's no one to utilize it at this point in time, or not right. significantly. At the poles, maybe, but when will that happen? Will it happen in five years? Will it happen in 10 years? I don't know. You know, I believe that the, the far side observatory concept could be initiated in less than two years. It could be initiated from, from, I, I mean, from, from prototype from to launch in two years. Yep. Yep. And in, in the, well, uh, no, not less than two, in a two or three year time period, there could be a launch and could start that effort directly. Right. You wouldn't have to wait for anybody else to do something there. Whereas if you go to the poles, as an example, uh, you'd still have to be waiting for who's going to be able to utilize that energy for what purpose and for what reason, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of a, that's kind of amazing to, to think. I mean, it, it, I really suspect that people do undervalue or underestimate the amount of power. You I mean you mentioned that again, the power, power, power. I think I'm going to borrow that, that that list because it's like everything utterly depends on it, and and it's got, it has to be there in place for every future endeavor right. that you plan to do, right. and it has to be there in a way that it's usable, that has like a base load across the entire lunar month, as opposed to you're a wash in power and then everything's frozen solid close to absolute zero. Right. And... right. So, 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 you know, you talk to a, a space technologist right now and you say, you've got a hundred Watts of power and they're overjoyed with a hundred Watts. We're talking about a hundred kilowatts of, of capability. On, yeah. On that now, let me add one more point, you know, right now, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, five years from now, we still have 14 day sunlight and 14 day night on the moon. Um, uh, you know, our scenario of building solar cells won't do much at night. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be some way to be able to have that electricity available for you at the nighttime, if nothing else, to stay alive. Um, but actually, in terms of the, the radio observatory, night is the best time for them to be looking. Uh, and so we also are developing now a thin film battery we could fabricate on the moon using the lunar resources. Now, Interesting. Okay. So that's, I mean, that's a whole separate conversation then. So what is right. the, what is the methodology to do a battery? So, so you need an, an anode, an anode, a cathode and electrolyte. Okay. That's a battery. And it turns out that, that the, that the anodes, for instance, you'd be, you'd have magnesium as an anode works well with a battery. Uh, you would have say, um, uh, alkali metal as a, as a cathode. Uh, available, uh, uh, sodium is an example. Um, uh, you, you would, you, the electrolyte becomes a little bit difficult because that would have to be something that would be brought from the earth. And in, in our battery an, an, uh, analysis, we need about 20% mass of the battery to be the electrolyte between 50 and 20%. That would have to be, have to be brought from earth. We could not utilize the and the internal resources for that. But 80% or 85% of the material for the battery is there on the moon. Right. And so we would make a divot in the lunar regolith. Inside that divot, we deposit our battery. The divot, lunar regolith is a very good insulator, both thermally and electrically. Uh, and in fact, the bat our battery design will operate at minus 100 degrees centigrade. So uh, no other batteries do that right now. You've got to heat them to keep them alive. Yeah. So we feel that this is something that could be a significant impact. Now, we're still in a design phase on this. Uh, and so uh, I can't say much more than yeah, that. Sure. But nonetheless, it's an approach that we're focusing on to kind of give us, you know, 24-7 coverage of energy on the surface of the moon. Um, and for us, uh, you know, the poles are interesting, exciting. A lunar base may or may not be there. It may be more equatorial. Uh, and that's ideal for us to make solar cells right. in that environment to support that. It, it's an, I, I mean, I think just that like the overall philosophy is like an interesting approach that that you're going less for a you're not trying to make necessarily the most highly efficient, but you're just trying to make them function like what kinds of of production can actually be done to make these things even functionally possible in this environment. Space is a thing you've got lots of. There's lots of space in space. And right. So, I mean, you know, I, you're right. We're, we're, our, our solar cells would be low efficiency, but we can make a hell of a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? We don't have to bring 
uh, anything there to, 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 to as you would if you want to deploy a solar array. Then you want to make them as highly efficient as possible, as low a mass as possible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We don't care. We're using the lunar materials. We can just keep producing them as a function of time and making larger and larger arrays and more and more energy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely fascinating. If people want to follow, uh, you know, or if perhaps some customers want to purchase uh, vast amounts of energy on the moon, um, where should they go to follow the progress of what you guys are working on? We have a, 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 a website, Lunar Resources. And, uh, let's see, Lunar Resources. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait, I can, I can find it. I, I can, can find, find it too. I'll race you. But... Um, uh, I think it's dot lunar, space. Uh, it's lunar resources dot space. Lunar resources dot space. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, they can find the uh, latest updates there. We're, we haven't populated it a lot just yet. We're still, yeah. uh, as I say, you know, we're only a couple of years old as a company, but we are moving forward. Have a number of programs underway now that have been funded uh, for both the uh, the lunar environment uh, as well as for the space environment for things like reflective coatings and uh, things of that nature. So um, uh, we're excited, we're enthused, uh, we're building on heritage that we've developed over the past 25 years that frankly NASA has supported part of that, industry has supported part of that, federal government through, through DOD has supported part of that. And we're building on all of that to be able to move forward and, and now really utilize the space environment for what it has, the benefits it has and the moon specifically in terms of the resources that are there. So w one last speculative question. When do we get a robot that can build a copy of itself? When do we get the von Neumann probe? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, ballpark. I, I, I'm not a robotics guy, so I really can't, uh, can't answer that for but you. But you know what they're made out of? So, you know, they're made out of chips and metal and solar panels and... Uh, I, I'm sure that if the parts were there, we'd, we'd, you know, a robot could assemble the parts and, and make another robot. I mean, you know, we're, we're using robots to make cars, right. make almost anything right now. So, so there, there are different the... kinds of robots, not the kind that we kind of think about with two arms and two legs. Yeah. But nonetheless, they're robots making a lot of the machinery. Yeah. So, so can you, you know, are the raw materials on the moon to make all the parts of one of your rovers? Um, they probably are right, uh, and you know you'd have to do um, uh, you know kind of printing the latest three D printing stuff uh, could do components uh, uh, in that environment. Um, it, it wouldn't be an immediate scenario, no, no, but just, it would be a down, down yeah. you know down. Letting our down imaginations just fly here uh, now for sure, yeah. for sure. Uh, so yeah, it's possible. It's yeah. doable. So. Um, Right now, you know, what we call is self-replicating is, is our, our solar cell array. Like I say, if something gets damaged, gets, uh, gets ruined, we just go make some more. Yeah. Uh, so the, the process is a self-replicating process, so to speak. Yeah. Wow, absolutely fascinating. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Uh, a lot of, I learned a ton of really interesting stuff. And, uh, and when you do land the contract to build the, uh, the Lunar Farside Telescope, please let us know. All right, we sure will. We sure will. All right. Appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. All right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you so All much. Right. Bye bye.